good morning and welcome to our class on Homer's Odyssey. I subtitle it, The World Without Fathers, because this particular great book is one of our most beautiful monuments to the importance of the family and of fatherhood uh, within that family. Uh, I don't know if it's always seen that way, uh, but I think as we go through it together, you and I, uh, we'll see that that's what Homer really does have in mind, even in perhaps 1200 BC, when we normally do not, uh, we're not told that the family is quite so important. Well, let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Augustine, pray for us. And St. Scholastica, pray for us. In the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm Dr. Henry Russell, uh, the headmaster of St. Augustine's Homeschool Enrichment Program, which is a Catholic classical program that my wife and I founded many years ago, and it's been very blessed. Uh, I'm also the author of the Catholic Shakespeare audio series. Uh, and, uh, well, enough of that, enough of me. The first slide is of the Apotheosis of Homer by Ingres, 1827. Thus, this is, a, of course, a romantic picture, not a classical picture. Um, and Ingres is being very clear that he thinks that Homer is so important uh, that he's virtually a godlike figure. And you have this beautiful angel you know, crowning him. And uh, this figure in the back with the, the laurel leaves, one doesn't quite know whether it's supposed to be the great poet Dante or simply the, the muse of epic poetry. But you, you get the idea that uh, our world has long valued Homer and what he has to teach us, uh, regardless of the distance between his time period and ours. Epics were, we believe, because we're always talking about things that are so far beyond our ability to fully capture in time. We believe they were epic. Uh, the epic was oral in its earliest beginnings. Uh, they would be chanted among a people. And they would be chanted uh, on a relatively regular basis. I don't know whether it's once a year, uh, on a great festival that would... Uh, you know, trigger the beginning of one of these, uh, or whether it was some other element. But it is a story, of course, whose ending becomes very well known, uh, certainly to the adults, and yet is chanted again and again and again. Uh, in other words, it is their story. It is the story of their being as a people, as a tribe, as a nation. Uh, the, it is, literature is not fundamentally an entertainment. Um, it is fundamentally uh, a connection with the gods in its origin. So we'll see that more and more as we go along. These epics were told by trained bards. Uh, a child would be selected perhaps at 11 or 12, who obviously had a fine memory. The older bard would teach him the lines of the poem or poems that he had memorized. Um, and they could memorize thousands of lines of poetry. At one point, this was disbelieved until after, well, after World War I in the Carpathian Mountains, uh, we came upon living bards who had some 49,000 lines of poetry in their memory. Well, each one probably, each bard could probably embellish the tale a little 
in his own way a bit, right? If he strayed too far, uh, his audience might uh, think he's a bit uh, radical and tell him to straighten up a little. But he did have the ability to, to add and subtract elements as he went along. Now at some point, and I'm speaking specifically about the Homerics, it's written down and becomes fixed in a kind of final form. Now historians generally agree that the events of the Trojan War occur around uh, 12,000 before Christ. But the records that there is such a thing as a written version of the Iliad and the Odyssey do not appear until around 800 BC. So, you know, we can use that as a reasonable uh, date for the emergence of a written and therefore somewhat final version of these great epics. There's a lot of controversy about who Homer is or whether Homer is. You'll find that there's a lot of controversy about everything that you could ever possibly say about a great book. Much of it somewhat useless, some of it quite, quite helpful. Uh, but, you know, was he the genius who began the tale orally some, sometime shortly, perhaps after 1200 BC? Or was he some towering figure in that 400 year cycle uh, of the oral period who just is so great, everybody says, okay, from now on, we're using Homer's version of this tale. Or is he the towering genius uh, who wrote it down in its fixed form that we read in translation today? I can happily tell you I have no idea. Uh, but I, I certainly believe that a towering figure named Homer existed and was deeply involved in both the Iliad and the Odyssey. I might have to take a, f a few minutes in our next session to talk about the Iliad, which is about the Trojan War itself. The Odyssey is about the return home uh, of a hero from the Trojan War, and yet we hear about many of his fellow heroes who were involved. So it might be good to just uh, spend a few minutes on that. But in more general terms, with an epic, and here I'm talking about an epic that arises out of a people, out of a culture, um, naturally, in, our, in, you know, in history. Or I'm talking about a man like J.R.R. Tolkien who knows the whole history of the epic. Or C.S. Lewis who uses elements of the epic. Uh, or Milton who again knows the history of the epic. These, these, these writers work within a tradition. And so I'm going to sketch out a couple elements of that tradition. Now the epic hero literally means son of the god. So the word hero is not just anybody who's brave or who does something wonderful. It really means he is born of the union of a god and a human being. Okay? Uh, and thus he is a bridge, literally, between the human and the divine. So on that level, of course, we should see him as somewhat unique, although pretty quickly you'll find out that at least in Greek epics, um, you know, you probably have five or six or seven people in the epic who are heroes or heroines in that sense, that they are a, a bridge between the godly and the human. In the Iliad, the great figure is Achilles, uh, but you also have Helen of Troy, Aeneas and Sarpedon, and they're among others who are a child of the gods. <laughs> <laughs>